Joshua Cooper and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around Our World on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii and Moana Nui Akea. Today we're looking at Article 1, Born Free and Equal, Demanding Dignity and Realizing Rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides the power of ideas to initiate progressive social change around the planet, and Article 1 is foundational right, upon which many of the remaining ID UDHR articles depend on for individual dignity and collective well-being. Article 1 recognizes that all human beings are born free, equal, and dignity and rights. And we're so excited to be talking with Andrea today. Andrea, thank you so much for joining us. And could you share with us why Article 1 is so important in this world we live in today? Respectful greetings to you, uh, my relatives, and our heartfelt Love and prayers go to the indigenous peoples and all of the peoples of the community of Lahaina in Hawaii. Um, today, uh, we are um, devastated along with uh, you, you there in Hawaii for what has happened uh, to the people there and the impacts of climate change, which will only keep increasing. We're suffering here in uh, the west coast of the United States from a hurricane as well, the first one that's hit uh, Southern California since they say 1939. And even though I'm in the desert in, um, in Arizona, the homeland, along with Northern Mexico of the Yaqui Nation, my peoples, um, we are, we're getting some rainfall, but we have many, many relatives along the Pacific coast. And uh, this is something that uh, we're working on to uh, insist that Indigenous people's solutions and impacts be respected in the work on climate change. I think that all of us uh, who are Indigenous grew up with the impacts of racial discrimination and the inequalities that exist in um, the current structures around the world. So this article is in particular important for us um, as we moved through the UN system um, beginning in 1974, when the International Indian Treaty Council was uh, founded because of the lack of justice in the structures and the justice systems of nation states, not just the United States, but uh, the founding of the International Indian Treaty Council on Standing Rock in 1974, there were about 5,000 delegates from throughout the hemisphere, all talking about the lack of justice, the lack of redress, the continuing human rights violations we were experiencing. So for that reason, uh, we decided to go into the international arena as nations, as treaty nations, uh, to seek a seat with the family of nations and look for justice and redress there. By the way, I will say this because I think it's important for this discussion that um, I've had the opportunity in all of these years of work internationally um, to be um, in literally every continent, uh, maybe except Antarctica, uh, working with indigenous peoples and uh, realizing that indigenous peoples, as indigenous peoples, we don't have um, any literal translation for the term human rights. Um, we'd say in Yaqui and in, in our uh, indigenous language, Yomem Tekia, the people's responsibility or duty to the creator and the created world together, which means other human beings, it means defending our own uh, ways of life, defending the natural world, um, but that's a responsibility. And so we had to learn the rights language and how to talk about it. And when we first read the Universal Declaration on Human Rights that was uh, put in place in 1948 by the United Nations, the Family of Nations, uh, we resonated culturally with what it said. You know, especially I wanna say um, the first uh, sentence of the preamble is very important for how to understand Article One, which I'll talk about. It says, where is, Whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The words inherent and inalienable 
very much speak to the ways that Indigenous peoples understand our rights and responsibilities, that no one gives you those, no declaration, no constitution, no treaty, no law, but those are ours because of who we are, placed by the Creator on our homeland. And so no one can give or take away human rights. Um, they can be violated and are continually, or they can be respected, but they can't be given or taken away. And this is very important. And this translates into our language that inherent and inalienable rights and dignity. And when you read then um, the first um, article of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights affirming equality, it needs to be read through the, that lens in our point of view. It says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. And again, that dignity and rights are inherent and inalienable according to the preamble of the declaration. They are endowed, means we, members of the human family, are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood with these principles of inalienable uh, dignity and inherent rights um, that the Declaration affirms. And this is very important because when we began to work on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that expands what is contained um, in the Universal Declaration, which affirms rights for members of the human family, individuals, all individuals, all human beings, we began to look at collective rights and how Indigenous peoples' rights as individuals are expressed through our membership um, in our peoples, in our nations, and how our rights are collective, our land rights, language, spiritual practices, cultures, all of those rights that are um, affirmed in the Universal Declaration are in fact collective rights for Indigenous peoples. So in the preamble of the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, we had the opportunity to define for ourselves and expand on the affirmation in the Universal Declaration. And this is what it says in the preamble, recognizing the urgent need to respect and promote the inherent rights of indigenous peoples, which derive from their political, economic, and social structures, and from their cultures, spiritual traditions, histories, and philosophies, especially their rights to their lands, territories, and resources. So for us, this is the implementation and the context of the implementation of the right affirmed in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration and just puts some context on it uh, from the point of view of Indigenous peoples. So all of these rights, we feel, are contained in that one uh, article and can be implemented um, by Indigenous peoples uh, accordingly. Thank you so much, Andrea. And it's true, it's inalienable and inherent are absolutely at its core. And also what's quite crucial as well is that the impact that you're sharing, that these international human rights are, are absolutely essential as we move forward. But you also then summarize it so well of interspecies and understanding how everything is interconnected. And that's really why Article One is sort of the heart of all that we're looking at. Could you share with us a bit of what first inspired you to care about the issue and some of the first campaigns you're involved in around Article One of the UDHR? Well, I think that all of us um, who <laughs> are indigenous experienced uh, experiences, life experiences as children, as, as very young people that made us realize that um, this uh, reason and conscience and, and the implementation of equality, you know, really did not exist as it should in the world that we were in. And I remember um, experiences, for example, in the fourth grade, even where I was selected as the indigenous uh, child with long grades 
to play the role of the Indian welcoming the colonizers to the land in California, Junipero Serra, the priest, and my, my role was to get down on my knees and kiss his ring, this kid wearing a bathrobe, right? Pretending to be Junipero Serra, for, it was for the end of school play. Uh, kids still to this day study California history in fourth grade in California. I had to kiss his ring and say, thank you, Padre, for giving us God. You know, that was, that was, I knew, I didn't know the history, the real history of the missions and the genocide against California Indian, um, indigenous peoples, but I knew that was wrong. And I went home and I wouldn't go back to school for the rest of the year. And my mother, uh, may she rest in peace, uh, didn't make me go back. She knew it was wrong too. Um, other experiences, you know, were just racism coming from my friend's parents uh, and those kinds of elements that made us feel less than as, as children and understand as we learn more that this is a product of colonization. Um, this is a product of racial discrimination and how that whole history came about, you know, the discovery of the Americas by Columbus, for example, you know, which is another, another lie of history. Um, we try to promote truth in history. Uh, we try to tell the truth about what happened and the process of colonization and how indigenous peoples have survived that oppression and that, um, uh, doctrine of discovery, you know, colonization that we had to suffer. So all of this, I think, has built up to who we are today, no matter where we're from, um, as Indigenous peoples, we've experienced it, and we knew in our heart that this was wrong. And that's why I, I really love uh, this article, because it not only affirms equality and dignity and rights, but it also speaks to how humans should act towards each other. You know, is that spirit of brotherhood upholding that equality? And we know that it doesn't today. Um, one, one example um, that we're working on, I know you'd like to see how we're implementing this, um, is as, as you well know, we've been working for many, many years and it's affirmed in the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the right of repatriation um, of our sacred items and human remains. And it's an example of the inequality we still suffer that only indigenous people's um, human remains, ancestral remains are displayed and not only displayed, but bought and sold by auction houses around the world as some kind of artifacts. You know, we just, um, the Yaki Nation, uh, just this last uh, July, after a 20 year struggle, got our sacred Masakova um, ceremonial deer head returned from the Museum uh, of Ethnography, the National Museum of Sweden. And we wrote them as soon as we discovered that it was there. It's a living being to us. It's like seeing a child in a glass cage when I first saw it. Um, we say Saila Maso, our little brother, the deer. But when our spiritual leader, very soon after I returned and told them what had happened, wrote them and said, this harms our people to have it there. It needs to be taken care of by those entrusted to fulfill that role by our own laws. Um, we thought, well, they'll give it back right away. They'll say, oh, we didn't know. We'll come get it. But it took us 20 years of using the United Nations mm -hmm. and using um, articles like this to assert the equal rights that we have to our sacred and ceremonial objects that are still being unearthed and dug up and our cemeteries are, I have a beautiful picture um, here of them digging up an Indian uh, cemetery to build a road in California and a picture of a beautiful well cut with a signed Christian ceremony on it where they would never think of you know, digging up graves to, to put a, a road through. It's just one of the many examples. But the positive thing is we are asserting those rights and we are making progress because now um, the United Nations recognizes that our laws governing the use and um, the placement of our sacred items and ceremonial um, uh, 
uh, belongings, um, our patrimony have equal weight with the laws of countries and the laws of the United Nations. Um, and we're being able to use that and that will be for everybody. No, oh, it's really important. And I, I love the historical context, looking at where the discrimination begins, the prejudice that's been practiced by different nations as well as different cultures, and then challenging that to then see the world in a new way through conscience, through actually caring for one another. And as you talked about earlier, it's that responsibility or that kuleana that we actually have a duty to take care of our earth first and one another. The message of Malama Honu is absolutely essential. What's so exciting is this year, the 100th anniversary of Descahe's visit to Geneva and the International Indian Treaty Council being the Realizing that justice and use can you share a bit on how IITC actualizes the articles in the international human rights system? Absolutely. Um, as as I mentioned, the International Indian Treaty Council was formed out of the struggle of American Indians and. Um, Many of, and the, by, by saying American, I mean throughout the Americas, not United States. Uh, but when we got to the United Nations, um, where we were sent by our elders to seek a voice because we had no voice in the, in the national justice system, so to speak, um, there were no other indigenous peoples there. Um, we were the first indigenous peoples organization to be recognized um, with consultative status at the UN Economic and Social Council in uh, way back in, in uh, 1977, but also um, we were the first to be what's called, I think the only still to date, upgraded to uh, what's called general consultative status in 2011, because exactly what you're saying, we take uh, the struggle uh, for rights and our responsibility to ensure that they are protected um, in many different bodies of the United Nations. And just thinking, and like we were talking about what's happening um, now, um, the suffering going on in Lahaina, the hurricanes happening in California, um, a lot of it is because of um, what's called climate crisis right now today, the, the unbridled and unceasing exploitation of uh, the natural resources and the natural world of our mother earth. And we've been telling uh, the nation states for many, many years, you need to listen to the ancestral knowledge, the original sciences of indigenous peoples, uh, or we're going to end up in this situation. And we've been participating at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We've been able to officially get a body there where we sit on an equal standing and equal number with the countries. I think the only uh, body uh, in the UN system where indigenous peoples actually on our own select our representatives, um, not this discriminatory uh, fashion of, you know, we can nominate to the permanent forum or the expert mechanism on rights of indigenous peoples, but the states, they'll, they'll decide what's best for us and who should be you know, the expert members. This one, we actually get to decide ourselves. And we've been able to move that into official recognition. Um, this year, it will be 30 indigenous people's knowledge holders and practitioners will be there meeting directly with the nation states and informing them not only of the struggles that we're going through because of climate change, where we have the least uh, contribution to the problem, we are the first on, on the front lines to experience the impacts. But also our um, recommendations of how things must change, or you know, we may join the, the million species that are predicted to become extinct by the United Nations due to climate change, and we can see that all over. Why, why would we be exempt from that? We're part of the natural world and human beings, the human family, as they say, are, are the cause of the problem. Indigenous peoples have solutions. 
that have been discounted because of discrimination, because of racism, because they see us as folkloric or somehow, you know, dance and sing for us, but don't tell us anything um, that really makes a difference. You know, that's changing now. And we're, we've been able to change that, at least in the discussions on climate change. Now, will they do what's necessary, which is a radical and immediate um, transformation of the fossil fuel economy? Um, we don't know, but we know that they are listening to us in a way that they have not in the past. You know, they, they recognize we have science that is so um, developed way beyond, uh, you could say, Western science. You know, our traditional yaki uh, food producers to this day, I've seen it, can look at the moon, can talk to the insects and see if next year it's gonna be a wet year or a dry year, a cold year or a hot year, so they know what color of corn to plant now because they know what the weather is gonna be in the future. You know, the Western scientists can't do that, but they're finally beginning to break through that discriminatory kind of racist, um, in un unequal approach to science and understand that they need to listen to us and it's to their benefit as well. Extra point of we've got to stop the exploitation and really focus on exchange, mutual exchange based on respect and human rights for all. You really brought up a great point about the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and Indigenous Access, but also the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Maybe you can share how Indigenous peoples have really transformed the UN and been able to make really a state-run system listen to the voice of the people who really care for the planet as well as one another, which is at the essence of Article 1. You mentioned uh, Deskaje, uh, the Haudenosaunee leader that went to the League of Nations 100 years ago. And we had beautiful uh, celebrations and commemorations in Geneva um, in July, commemorating that, as well as uh, the travels of Ratnaha, the, the Maori spiritual leader, um, who also went at the same time, totally independent. And they went there as treaty nations, as um, those that should be seated with the family of nations. And of course, they were not even allowed to come into the building um, at the League of Nations. And so, of course, you know, it seems like the progress can be very slow at the United Nations, but if you look and see how far we've come in terms of being fully participatory, we had an indigenous representative um, who became the first uh, indigenous um, president of a treaty, UN treaty body, the third, the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, talking about, you know, discrimination here. Um, we are now recognized as independent experts and representatives uh, at many, many United Nations bodies where that was unheard of. Our first body at the United Nations was the Working Group on Indigenous Populations founded back in 1982. Even though the topic was Indigenous, we weren't called peoples yet then at the UN system, but populations, they drafted um, together with the indigenous participants and the state members, the first uh, UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But it was not even considered that all five expert members of the working group on indigenous populations were not indigenous. Uh, it was not even on the table that, hey, shouldn't these, at least a couple of them be uh, indigenous peoples? They were all selected by the nation states and they weren't even, you know, considering including an indigenous expert. So if you look now how we created uh, bodies like the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, um, positions like the United Nations Rapporteur on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, bodies like the Expert Mechanism on Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where it's assumed that those experts are going to be indigenous. And the fact that indigenous peoples are now um, participating in expert seminars, are called on to be experts in many, many UN processes, um, such as the UNFCCC, which was probably one of the most discriminatory and hard to participate in uh, for indigenous peoples. We were not even allowed to be in the room 
when the Paris Agreement was uh, drafted back in 2015, for example. You know, so it's still a challenge there to actually take part in the negotiations. However, we are being listened to and our participation is broad throughout the entire UN system now. Um, sometimes it's hard to even keep up with all the places that we can be and, and should be. Again, not just to address the violations of our rights and the ongoing and rampant discrimination and inequality that exists, the repression against human rights defenders, even the, the assassinations of indigenous human rights defenders that is continuing to this day. We also have a responsibility, Yomantekia, to be at the table to contribute, not just to our own survival, but to the survival and the equal rights and dignity of all members of the human family, because we don't feel that being a colonizer and an oppressor is uh, really fulfilling dignity either. So it's probably, you know, less dignified to be a, a colonizer than it is to be colonized. And we have a responsibility to everyone's children and future generations, not just uh, indigenous peoples. And that, that really summarizes how indigenous peoples have been able to identify the larger issues that even human rights haven't connected. I remember really being at the working group on indigenous populations and bringing up change initially in the first studies by Francois Hempson that looked at threat of extinction and loss of land. And no one had really identified. So only really a pioneer in the field for what's most important and where we need to head. Can you share with us a bit about the, your vision for the future of this right? I think that um, the human family and um, many, many um, elements and members of the natural world, our relatives, the plants and the animals and, and all of the elements are really at a preface right now. Uh, we are um, facing um, a dreadful situation in terms of our ability to survive in the natural world. And we're seeing it here. We, we had, we're in the Sonora Desert. We had the hottest uh, July ever recorded in the history of the world, the whole planet. And the survival um, and the vision of indigenous peoples makes us understand that our teachings are needed more than ever now. And what we see for the future, of course, you know, the vision that we have um, for equality and dignity and our rights to lands, um, resources, culture, self-determination, being respected um, has to be put in the context of the crisis situation that we're seeing in terms of climate change. Otherwise, as they say, we might be just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, we have to address this issue and indigenous peoples have to be respected uh, and given an equal voice in the decisions that are being made today. Excellent point. And really article one says, we have to understand that beyond being born free and equal in dignity and rights, we're all endowed in our world with reason and conscience and should act towards one another, spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. And that's really what indigenous peoples have modeled at the UN through direct action when needed, many actions that you've taken, but also through diplomacy to make sure that these promises on paper are reality in the daily lives of people around our planet. Yes, that's true. I, I just wanna end with saying one thing, and that's that, um, we look at these beautiful words on paper, like you say, and the recommendations from the special rapporteurs uh, and UN bodies and the treaty bodies, how, how the states should change their behavior, states meaning countries in the UN system. Uh, and the question keeps coming up, where's the teeth? How are these things actually gonna get implemented? And I always look back to the words of, of one of our um, indigenous leaders here after um, the country visit of Special Rapporteur James Anaya to the United States. 
in 2012. We had all these great recommendations. We set up all these hearings. He made incredibly strong recommendations to the United States, how they should change and implement the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And, but he, we came to a meeting after to kind of assess everything that had happened and evaluate. And he said, you know, I was thinking we have these great recommendations, but where are the teeth in the UN process? We have these great declarations, we have these great conventions, but where's the teeth? And then I started re realizing, wait a minute, we're the teeth. We are the teeth. We are the ones that are going to make this happen because in spite of everything, um, those in power are still resisting. There's still not the political will. They don't even want to call for a um, phase out of fossil fuels at the UN Convention on Climate Change. You know, we have to make that happen um, by our strong stand. And we have to be the one that, as you say, are examples of the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood that's part of our indigenous teachings. We got to care about their kids too as well as ours. That's true. I mean, I remember saying earlier our you wants to take out tomorrow you. So we're all in this together. Seems sometimes sustaining it, but we appreciate all the work you've done for decades to make the world a better place and to actualize Article One. Thank you so much and look forward to see you at the next global meeting, maybe at the UN General Assembly. And thank you so much for all that you do on the 75th anniversary of the UDHR. You as well. Thank you.